I just want to know, is there anybody in here who's come to get a word? Is there anybody in here who's come to have church? Is there anybody who's come to preach and pray with the pastor? Because if you don't, I'll do it with him. Because he's able. Amen. Ephesians 3. It is a responsive reading in your bulletin. Ephesians 3. 14 to 21, it is a a responsive reading in your bulletin. Amen. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by christ jesus to all generations forever and ever amen may have your seats in the presence of the holy spirit now to him now to him amen let us pray Father, we bless you. We thank you. We honor you for this moment in this slice of time, in this hour where your word is designed to go forth. Lord, give us ears that we may hear. Give us hearts that we may be receptive. Give us hands that after we hear the word, we would do what you've instructed us to do. Lord, we pray for those who are looking for a church home. We pray they found it here at First Baptist of Cresma. Lord, we pray for those who may not know you as Lord and Savior, that when the invitation to discipleship is extended, they would come forth and give their life to you. Lord, we pray for the saints who are going through, who are struggling. We pray for their strength. But we also pray for those saints who are on the mountain right now that they would give you praise, they would give you the credit, they would give you the glory, for they know they would not be where they are right now if it had not been for you. And so, Lord, we just ask that in some form or fashion, our praise, our worship, this word, would be acceptable in your sight, our strength, and our redeemer. Let the people of God say, Amen. 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 Now to him who is able. Now to him. In verse 14, Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees. And Paul says, for this reason. But if we run back to the beginning of the book of Ephesians, Paul has variegated reasons that he ought to bow the knee to God. And by extension, we all have a multitude of reasons as to why we should bow the knee to God. We should bow the knee, according to Paul, because we are saints of God and have been counted faithful to serve God. We should bow the knee because grace and peace has been extended to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should bow the knee because we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We should bow the knee because we've been chosen in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in love in his 
sight. We should bow the knee because we were predestined for adoption by, as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ. We should bow the knee because in him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our sins. We should bow the knee because we have obtained an inheritance in him being predestined according to his purpose and according to his counsel and according to his will. We should bow the knee because we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit with a promise that we are inheritors of the redemption that God has promised us. We should bow the knee. I'm in chapter two because we were dead in our sins and trespasses. But God has made us alive together in Christ Jesus. We should bow the knee because we were once under the power of the prince of the air, meaning the devil. But now we've been delivered from darkness into God's marvelous light. We should bow the knee because by grace we have been saved that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works so that no man may boast. We should bow the knee because we are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We should bow the knee because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We should bow the knee because we who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. We should bow the knee because now we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so by the time Paul arrives in verse 14 and he says for this reason we ought to understand that there are variegated reasons as to why we should bow the knee. But Paul summarizes it in a reason and that reason is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of salvation to all who believe. That all of these reasons, the fact that we have faith, the fact that we've been saved, the fact that we have every spiritual blessing, the fact that we have been adopted as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ, the fact that we've been redeemed, the fact that we've been washed by the blood, the fact that we've been forgiven, the fact that we were dead, the fact that we're not alive and we're not alive all of that makes no difference if it were not for the one reason that all of the reasons are summarized in if it were not for the gospel if it were not for the good news if it wasn't for the fact that he was hung up for our hang-ups crucified for our crises buried for our blessings resurrected for our redemption ascended for our anointing if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side none of these things make a difference if he had not sent his only begotten son none of the variegated reasons matter and so Paul says for this reason I bow the knee to God and so he enumerates all of these reasons but then he goes on to lift up a prayer for the congregation because it's one thing for you to know the reasons it's another thing for you to experience the reasons and that's part and parcel as to why some of us don't have the praise that we ought to have because we understand that we've been saved but we have not experienced the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ Christ in our lives you've got to understand that it was a power to resurrect you and give you eternal life but that's not where the power stops because God does exceedingly abundantly so there is a power that delivered you from darkness into light there's a power that is giving you eternal life there's a power though that now resides in you rests in you abides on you to live a life that is greater than your own expectation and so Paul recognizing that the people of God many of them have not grabbed hold of the power experienced the power of God in their life he goes on to pray that I pray for you that he would grant you riches in his glory that you would be strengthened with power by the spirit in the inner man that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith that he would root and ground you in love that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height that you would know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge that you would be 
filled with God. And so Paul is not content with you just knowing that you're saved, knowing there was a power that redeemed you, knowing there was a power that saved you, knowing there was a power that gave you resurrected life. But he prays that the church will actually experience that power in their life. And as he ends the prayer in verses 20 to 21, he breaks out in doxology. And doxology is simply a short hymn or a form of words that ascribe praise to God. Doxology is not only found here, but doxology is found in Romans chapter 11, where God says, where, where Paul says, um, now to, where Paul says, uh, where Paul says, oh, the depth and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his thoughts and his ways past finding out. For from him and to him and through him are all things. To God be the glory. Amen. Doxology is found in 1 Samuel chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be glory and honor forever amen doxology is not only found there but Jew gets in on doxology where he says now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his glorious presence with exceedingly great joy to the only wise true God our Savior be glory majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore amen and then John doesn't want to get left out because in Revelation chapter 1 John breaks out in doxology John says to him who loved us and washed us from our sins by his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory, dominion, forever and ever. Amen. Doxology is simply a short hymn or a form of words that ascribe praise to God. And as Paul ends his prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, he breaks out in doxology. Now, it makes sense if he broke out in doxology at the beginning of the prayer because the bible talks about enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise that's not just a physical entrance but whenever we enter into the presence of God via prayer we ought to enter in with thanksgiving and enter in with praise for the privilege of being able to come boldly before his throne of grace so it makes sense if he broke out in praise at the beginning of the prayer but we arrive at the end of the prayer and before he can say amen he breaks out in praise it wasn't after the prayer it was near the end of the prayer prayer and if you look deeper the praise breaks out in the middle of the letter we're at the end of chapter three the letter rolls on to chapter six it doesn't make sense for the praise to break out in the middle of it not for Paul not for the diminutive one but the intellectual giant not for the one who went to the pharisaical schools not for the one who sat at the feet of the renowned rabbi Gamaliel not for the one who was fluent in his Greek that if we looked at Paul Paul would not be the prototype to just break out in praise in the middle of a thought that if we look at Paul, Paul is the conservative one. Paul is the intellectual one. Born. Paul is the educated one. It doesn't seem as though Paul would be that person but when you think about all that God has done for you, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are it doesn't matter how educated you are, it doesn't even matter how conservative you are. See some of us think we don't have it in our character and in our constitution to give God this type of praise but when you think about what God has done and what God has the potential to do in your life in the middle of it you will break up and give God praise now I know that some folk like to go with the order of service and I know some folk like to flow in the program and at this point in the sermonic word it may not be the right time to give God praise but I wonder if I have some doxologists in the house see doxologists don't need a time to give God praise they don't need an appropriate reason to give God praise when they think about all that God has appropriated for them they'll break out in praise when it's 
Paul is teaching us how to give doxology in the middle of it. We're in the middle of the book. If I have doxologists in a house, doxologists will praise God in the middle of it. In the middle of your distress. In the middle of your anxiety. In the middle of your worry. In the middle of your disagreement. In the middle of your divorce. In the middle of your sickness. In the middle of your brokenness. In the middle of your heartache. Because when I think about what God has done and I recognize what God is doing. Paul is saying that in the middle of your heartache, in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of what you're going through, God is working to strengthen you. God is working to increase your faith. God is working to root and ground you in love. God is working to expand your knowledge. God is working to fill you with himself. It don't look good. I'm in the middle of it. But when I think about how far he has brought me, he who has done a good work in you will complete it. I can thank God in everything. And I can thank God for everything. Because I know what the end is going to be. He works all things to the good for them that love the Lord who have caught, been called according to his purpose and I just can't believe that he's brought me this far to leave me right now Paul in the middle of it encourages himself in the Lord and breaks out in doxology and by encouraging himself he encourages the church to understand that God is doing a work In you, he says, now to him, now to him who is able. That, that word now can also be translated moreover. Moreover to him. Just in case we, we stagger at what God has already done as if he can't do anymore. And just in case we stumble at this lofty prayer that Paul has lifted up as if God is unable to answer. Paul says moreover he's able to do more than what he's already done and over what has already been asked you can't ask God for too much because God has more than enough and you can't think more than God because God thinks deep enough he says now moreover that whatever you think God has done in your life he can do more than what he's already done and what you've already asked for God can do over what you asked for I wish I had time to tell you that when you pray to God and God does exactly what you expect him to do then you didn't pray enough God always does beyond what you expect him to do. So when God answers your prayer and you say, I expect God to do that, then really you didn't pray big enough. God always does exceedingly past our expectation. Good God, when they prayed for a deliverer, they expected the deliverer to come from the line of David. They expected him to come in human form, but they did not expect that it would be God himself in the flesh. Whenever you pray to God, if God meets your expectation, it means that you didn't pray big enough because when God shows up, it's always exceed. God never operates simply on the level that you pray on. God is always working on another level. Exceedingly is another level. Abundantly is another dimension. When God answers my prayer, God always answers on another level. And if I'm really in the faith, and if I'm really trusting God, and if I'm really looking for God, he'll take me into another dimension. He says, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. Now unto him, unto him, unto him, you understand that you got it going on when folk just say him. When nobody has to say the name and they just say him and everybody in the room know who you talking about. 
It's one thing when you just go by one name and everybody knows who you're talking about. But when folks say to his glory and you already know who they talking about. When folks say now unto him and you know who they talking about. You know you got it going on when nobody ever even say your name and everybody in the room knows who you talking about. Now unto him. That means that God is able to do more over simply because of who he is. Now unto him, by virtue of his character, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Now unto him, Elohim, the plurality of majesty, the one who spoke and worlds leapt into existence, El Shaddai, God Almighty, the mighty God, uh, Jehovah Shabbat, the Lord of hosts, the God, um, the God of armies, Jehovah Sikhanu, God is our righteousness, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner and our victory, Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, God is our healer, Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he maketh me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul Jehovah Makadosh the God who sanctifies Jehovah Shama, the God who's there who's always available a very present help in time of trouble God is able to do simply because of who he is it's in his character it's in his makeup. Now unto him who is able. Somebody say able. able. Able means according to the power, according to the resources, according to the ability that is inherent in a person. That means that God is able to do just what he said he would do because he has the qualifications. I wish I had time. Able. When you talk about ability, you're talking about what's inherent to an individual. When you talk about capability, you're talking about what's inherent to a corporation. We use them interchangeably. But if you're talking about correct English, when you're talking about an individual, you're talking about their ability. But when you're talking about a corporation, you're talking about their capability. Well, when I think about who God is, my God is able because he's one God. But he is capable because he's three guys in one. So my God is not only a person, but he's corporate. He's a corporation. That my God has the ability and he has the capacity to do exceedingly abundantly simply because he's qualified to do it. Because he's God. He's qualified to do godly things. He said to Jeremiah, is anything too hard for me? And when there was a man with a demon-possessed son that came to Jesus and said, if you can do anything Jesus answered him with incredulity he said if you can it was as if Jesus said wait a minute do you know who you talking to if you can what do you mean if you can this is the God that walked on water like it was a sidewalk if you can this is the one this is the God who healed, who healed the eye nerve so that people can see if you can this is a God who healed the auditory receptacle so that people could hear if you can this is a God that healed ligaments so that the lame could walk if you can this is a God who spoke to the waves and tell them, told them to settle down and told the storm to shut up if you can this is a God who woke up the dead like they were simply taking a nap if you can all things are possible he is able to do because he's God and because he's God, he's qualified. As a matter of fact, humanly speaking, if he was applying for the job to be God, I would say that he's overqualified. That when it comes to God, his resume can't fit on one piece of paper. That when it comes to God, a portfolio is not big enough. That when it comes to God, if he put his resume in magazine form, it still wouldn't be enough. So what he decided to do 
was to put his resume in book form. And even though his resume is in book form, John said, if I wrote everything that Jesus did, it wouldn't even be able to fit in all the libraries in all the world. If he was applying for the job to be God, we might turn him down because we couldn't pay him enough because he's overqualified. He's overqualified. All you got to do is get to the first chapter. And by the time you get to the first chapter, you already know that he's more than qualified. There's a God who spoke to nothing and something came into existence. He then took things out of something, then took something, made somebody, and then poured someone out of somebody. Now, if I don't know what qualifications you would look for with God, but I'm looking at his resume and and I'm telling you that he's more than qualified. Somebody shout he's able. He's able. And he says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You can't ask big enough. You can't think deep enough. You can't ask broad enough. Your thinking is not wide enough. Our problem is we don't ask big enough. We don't think deep enough. That God, oh my goodness, if Paul wrote it, that means God is able. If he wrote it, that means that God is also willing. Why would Paul write it and tell us that God is able if God were not willing? See, God doesn't play games. God doesn't tease us. If God says he's able, that means that God is willing. He's willing to meet your limits with his limitless. He's willing to meet your impotence with his omnipotence. He's willing to meet your shortcomings with his power. God is able. God is willing. So much so that he's put his power. God is so willing. And God is so able that what God does is he puts the mind of Christ in you. And what God does is he puts his spirit inside of you. And what God does is he turns your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Because you could not ask for what God wants you to ask for because of what God wants to do in your life. Because you are limited. It has nothing to do so much with your humanity as it has to do with your sin. Because if we just talked about strict humanity remember Adam was human but Adam didn't have sin so he and God walked with one another in the garden in the cool of the day that means that Adam was able to ask on an exceeding level and Adam was ever to, able to think on an abundant level because of his relationship with God it was not about our humanness it's about our sinfulness and because of our sinfulness we can't ask beyond our needs we can't ask beyond our desires we can't ask beyond our understanding we can't ask beyond our context we can't ask beyond our concepts and because we can't ask beyond those things God said I'm going to put myself inside of them so I can have a communication with myself in other words God said I'm going to put myself inside of you so I can have a conversation with myself because you can't ask for what I want to do in your life you can't think on the level that I'd like you to think so I'm going Gonna put me inside of you so that when you pray it's not just you praying but it's me talking to myself and so here's God talking with God and God says you come over and listen to this conversation that we're having so as you listen to the conversation that we're having you can start to ask for what I really want you to ask for so I can do in your life what I want <laughs> 